you. At this time, I would like to call upon um, His Grace, uh, Archbishop Emeritus Terence Prendergast, to please say an opening prayer. I'm a bit shorter than you are, thank you. <laughs> you can't expect a bishop just to say a prayer. He has to say a few words, huh? <laughs> and you may know that in the history of the church, cardinals and popes and bishops were sponsors of the arts. And I never really did very much, except that I asked Michael to do a painting for me one time, which he did. And um, it was a wonderful painting, and I, I'm going to use it next week to teach, to talk to the priests of Saskatoon about the, the importance of our relationship with Jesus as a disciple, so. And you see all the beauty around us, his paintings. And that speaks of truth, which is a theme of Our Lady Seed of Wisdom College. And of course, goodness is what we all hope for in our lives. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Heavenly God, creator of the universe, Create of our hearts and souls and minds and beings. We praise you for artistic merit and work, for the struggle to express beauty, to lift up our hearts and our spirits. We give you thanks for the ministry and service to the church and our and the community, water community, of Michael O'Brien as a painter and a writer. We ask you to bless Seed of Wisdom College and his work there. We pray for all the benefactors of the college. We pray for this evening that it may be a joyful occasion. We may always give you thanks and praise every day of our life with every breath of ours. We make our prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint Patrick. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Grace. My name is Dr. Christine Schinken. I'm the president of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College. This evening, we are celebrating a retrospective art exhibit featuring the work of Michael D. O'Brien, and also celebrating 50 years of religious art by Michael O'Brien. 45 years ago, he had a religious art exhibit at St. Patrick Hall, so essentially the same location, um, but in a, in a hall that I think was later turned into a parking lot, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> but in spirit, the same location. So it's, it's a very special time. Uh, this event is organized uh, and hosted by Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College in conjunction with Justin Press and also with the help of uh, St. Patrick's Basilica. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College is a Catholic liberal arts college. Our mission is essentially to educate the whole person in the Catholic liberal arts. We're now in our 23rd year, and Michael O'Brien and Sheila, his wife, were among the founders of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. So it's really appropriate that we're having this event together. And um, our, Michael O'Brien is also our artist and writer in residence. So we're very privileged to have him. He's been in that position for a number of years now. Uh, so to introduce him properly, I will introduce uh, Professor Richard Shaw, uh, who is a professor of history and has been uh, at Our Lady Seed of Wisdom College since 2013. So we've been blessed to have him as our um, history chairman since that time. Uh, and he was recently, recently awarded full professorship, so uh, we're very proud of that achievement. Uh, he's a wonderful teacher, or inspiring professor, and a wonderful scholar as well. He has many publications, too many to list, uh, and also including two major books on different aspects of Bede's ecclesiastical history. Professor Richard Shaw lives in Barry's Bay with his lovely wife, Christine, and their five children. Would you please welcome Professor Richard Shaw. Thank you, Christine. 
and uh, good evening everyone. I'm so pleased to be here tonight and I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, this is a wonderful event, richly deserved, and it's lovely to have so many people here to celebrate. Michael O'Brien and especially his art. Standing room only. That's how it should be. <laughs> 45 years. I want to join my thanks to Christine and others, to St. Patrick's, uh, to, Saint, to Justin Press, and to Our Lady Cedar Wisdom College as joint sponsors of this event. And to you all for coming. It's a great privilege for me to be asked to give this introduction on this special occasion. I'm incredibly proud to be speaking at the celebration of this man I admire so much. A great author, a great artist, a great mind, a great man. It is an honor to know Michael O'Brien and to call him my friend. Michael and his indomitable wife, Sheila, live quiet, humble lives in the little town of Barry's Bay. After odysseys of their own across Canada, this event is a coming home for Michael, a nostos, a homeward journey for him. 45 years since his first exhibition of Christian art here at St. Patrick's. Now he is back where he started. Michael was actually born in Ottawa in 1948. So it's a coming home for Michael in that sense too. There and back again. A hobbit's tale. <laughs> Michael has done a lot, a lot of good in that time. Michael is the author of nigh on 40 books, including a variety of powerful novels. Books which have been published internationally and translated into many languages across the globe. There's even a graphic novel in French now of Father Elijah. <laughs> He's produced perceptive and thought-provoking essays on faith and culture, again for an international audience, and many of which have been collected and published by Justin Press. And then there is his incredible art, a small but representative selection of which stands before us today. He's the artist and writer in residence at Our Lady Cedar Wisdom College, a college which Michael and his heroic wife Sheila played a major role in founding and continue to play a huge part in inspiring. Michael has won awards from Poland and America, from Croatia and Canada. And so we rightly gather today to celebrate him as an artist, as a writer, and as a man, and to honor his contributions to Canadian culture and globally his contributions to Catholic culture through his literature and through his art. This evening is focused on his art but I want to devote a word briefly at the beginning to a few of his books. Many of us will first have encountered Michael through his novels. Father Elijah, his first, is a must read. If, if you haven't read it yet, you need to, like start tonight. <laughs> if you have read it, read it again. I reread it in the summer and it is as compelling today as it was in the 1990s. It has lost none of its relevance it's, it's urgency. The Strangers and Sojourners, which I confidently predict will be a key part of the Canadian literary canon by the end of the century, and which remains, to my mind, the best guide to Catholic married life in literature. An Island of the World, which I read for the first time this year, and which, in my opinion, is one of the 10 best novels ever written, right up there with War and Peace, and no exaggeration stand in comparison to the Odyssey. A friend of mine made the comment the other day after a talk Michael gave. He said, we don't know it, but we are living in the age of Michael O'Brien. He meant that in times to come, they will speak of this period as the age of O'Brien, as we speak of the age of Shakespeare or the age of Dickens. They will ask what people did, how they lived in the age of O'Brien and they'll be talking about us. But us, because we lived in the age of O'Brien. Stop squirming, Michael. <laughs> it's true. We live in the age of Michael O'Brien. My talk tonight is an introduction to Michael's talk and will, in the nature of things, be something of a panegyric, a speech in praise. But in preparing my words, I was reminded of what Socrates says of panegyric in the symposium. 
It's only really praise if it tells the truth. So I want to begin with some truths, easily forgotten truths, perhaps uncomfortable truths, hard truths even. Who are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going? Standing in front of you today is Michael O'Brien. Standing in front of you today, the man whose books we love, whose art we admire, whose commentary we rely on, this modern genius. Standing in front of you today is a tired old man, <laughs> struggling constantly every day with debilitating sicknesses and personal and family troubles. So lacking in ego, you see him there, disappearing into, drowning in his uncomfortable suit. <laughs> pained, pained at the very praise we would seek to press upon him, while the devil would seek to overwhelm him. What was it all for, Michael, he says. What was the point? 45 years of suffering and struggle, heartache, pain, loss. He's a 10-year-old boy left outside alone, abandoned in the middle of a storm, and told to wrestle demons, unable to show his weaknesses and his struggles because so many people look to him for strength, rely on him to give them comfort, assurance, and wisdom when the seas are raging around them, around us. Fear, doubt, paralyzing sense of powerlessness. What place does art have? What place can art have in the battle for the world's soul? What can a painting do against Hollywood and the internet? What can a self-trained Christian artist do against mass media and postmodernism? And so much sludge, saturating us, overwhelming us, carefully designed to undermine us and our children and our families and our communities. So many lies. What can a word of truth or of goodness or of beauty do against the wall of lies? When faced with the immensity of evil in the world today, when matched against the profusion of terrible, infernal cultural products that we are washing today, it is difficult for all of us not to despair. Despair and die. That's the temptation we all feel. That is the siren song, the hiss of the snake. And we who owe so much to Michael, we who depend so much on him for answers and inspiration, when that voice whisp whispers in our ears, may forget that it shouts in his. Why did you suffer so much? What was it for? Well, I'm here to tell you, and I'm here to tell you, Michael, to remind you that it was worth it. What can man do against such enemies? He can do his duty. He can do what God asked him to do, his daily task. This Job you see before you has done just that. He did his duty. He knew his task. You found and fulfilled your vocation. What earthly reward do you expect for following your spiritual vocation? Praise? Wealth? Comfort? Power? That is not the way of the Christian. If you haven't suffered for your faith, it's not the Catholic faith. If it doesn't hurt, it's not the truth. The Lord scourges every son he receiveth. So you also, when you have done everything you were commanded, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Michael, you have done your duty. It's not for you to see the fruits. It's not given to you to know the future. What good will come from the good you have done? What providence will work with your obedience? You have done your job. That's enough. But you have done more than that. You have brought light and you have kept light alive. You've kept the flame of truth burning. And like a vessel of election, you've handed on to others, to another generation and generations around the world through your literature and through your art. Real light, not some shiny superficial sheen, reality, transcendental qualities, goodness, beauty, truth, helping to preserve what Cardinal Ratzinger called the memory of mankind. Not just talk about it, 
do, instantiate, embody, provide a model, offer an example, in practice. The art in front of you tonight is Michael O'Brien's art, but it's not just Michael O'Brien's art. The art in front of you is not just what you see in front of you. Every work has been prayed over. Every work is anointed. Every work is a product of divine inspiration, an epiphany of the infinitely creative mind of God. Every work is an icon, pointing beyond itself to a greater reality beyond, to God, to truth, to goodness, to beauty. These works do not point to Michael. They point onwards and upwards. They are a word pointing to the word, the Logos. But not only is every work in front of you tonight an icon, Michael is an icon as well. Michael does not want you to look at him, admire him. Like his works, Michael points beyond. This evening even, for Michael, for Michael, this evening isn't about Michael. Michael's grateful for our presence, humbled by it, embarrassed by it. Like, like all humans, he's touched by praise and sensitive to criticism. So praise him, buy his books, admire his paintings. But these gestures are not deep down what Michael wants. They are not why Michael does what he does. In fact, for Michael, who fears so deeply and rightly what he calls the cult of artist as personality, our praise is welcome, but it's another form of pain to him. For Michael, this evening isn't about Michael. To him, this evening is about you, me, us. If we want to show we appreciate what Michael has done, his art, his books, his work, his sacrifices, the many sacrifices of Michael and his wonderful wife, Sheila, we need to look beyond Michael to what Michael is pointing at. If we want to show we value his work, then we need to be changed by it. We need to change. We need to let the word that has been sown within us through Michael take root and bear fruit. We need to conform ourselves to the divine image within us, to submit our wills and actions to Christ. We need to be transformed, transfigured, ultimately by the cross, until we, like Michael and his work, become true icons, pointing upwards and heavenwards, not selfwards. This event about Michael begins with Michael, but it ends with us. Who are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going? Michael's journey to this point tonight, back to Ottawa, back to his beginnings, there and back again, 45 years on, 74 years on, is a nostos, a homeward journey. His life and our lives are a homeward journey of a different and larger kind, however. We are exiles here. Our destiny is eternity. But our true homeward journey is no straightforward affair. Michael's art, Michael's books, Michael's life show us that we will have to meet and fight many monsters on our way back home. But that the, that the one we finally need to vanquish is within ourselves. And we cannot do that alone. We can only do it with the aid of God's grace by submitting and surrendering our wills to his. Michael's art, Michael's life, Michael's work has given us a word. And like a true icon, his word echoes the word. If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Michael, every day you stand ready to be sacrificed. The time of your dissolution is never far from hand. You have fought the good fight. You have kept the faith. You have done your duty. It was worth it. It is worth it for all of us that we may never see that fruit on this earth. But I want you to know, Michael, we all want you to know how much you mean to us, how much you have helped us, and how much we love you, not just your art and your books, you. And when the Lord comes, you will hear those welcome words warmly spoken as to a son or to a friend. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Your reward will be great in heaven. No more tears, 
No more heartache, no more pain. Truth, goodness, beauty, those things you have always sought over the last 45 years and more, in their fullness, revealed before you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, and God bless you. Michael O'Brien, everyone. Thank you, Richard. That means an immense amount to me, what you said, especially towards the end. Thank you. Is my voice coming across here? No, sorry. You didn't miss a thing. <coughs> right into it. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, what you said. Uh, means more than I can express. It's right. If there's any genius in the room, it's not me. <laughs> so you spoke right to the core of the matter. Uh, who are each of us? Where have we come from and where are we going? Who are we? These essential questions of what it is to be human at all times of history are in very great danger of being lost in our times. And a great deal of this loss, this erosion, uh, occurs through culture, the indoctrination of culture. We are all saturated in an artificial culture, which has many redeeming qualities, admittedly. Lucifer is an angel of light, fallen. He knows how to play with light. <sighs> of course, there is much good in our culture because it has human sources. It comes forth from human beings. And it is practically impossible to eradicate the image and likeness of God in human beings. So there will always be good mixed in with the corruptive. But it is the very nature of contemporary culture that has a capacity for corrupting us in a way that no previous culture in the history of mankind, even the most depraved pagan cultures, have. Our culture sweeps over any inherent instinctive critical fact faculty. It paralyzes us. It addicts us. This addictive quality of contemporary culture is one of its more worrisome, worrying uh, characteristics. So as Richard said very well, you know, what are we to do in the face of this? Well, we must do what man has always been called to do, and that is to live in the truth and to be not just in what we produce, bad word, uh, what we make, but to be in ourselves uh, a living word of truth. And that is only possible only possible by living in the fullness of Jesus Christ in his church. He is the one, he is the one who shows us where we have come from, who we are, and where we are going. In his 1999 letter to artists, Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, uh, says oh, so many things. It's well worth reading for all of us, even non-artists. He says, man is a mystery to himself. Man is a mystery to himself. And the arts, the Christian arts, are a powerful means of helping man to know himself, to know who he truly is as a son and daughter of the Father, as a child of the Father who made him, and of the Savior who redeemed him. Our faith is, has highly developed theology and philosophy, uh, piety. All of this is part of its vast richness. But at its core, at its core, 
is a living Savior, a living Son of God, one with the Trinity, who became man for us and suffered with us and for us. Artists have a wide variety of streams in their inspiration and their expressions. Uh, many schools of art can be uh, immersed in the waters of baptism, so to speak, and bear its own fruit, its own particular fruit. That is all good. That is part of the richness of the kingdom of God. For myself, I have felt, because we are a society that flees the cross, denies the cross, I have felt that it was my particular call to paint the things, the mysteries of the cross, including human suffering. To say, this is not the end. I think it was John Paul II himself, maybe it was Cardinal Ratzinger in one of his books says that the major illness of the modern age is a kind of despair a despair that people have about the possibility of even knowing love, of giving love, of receiving love, of being loved, of knowing truth. Postmodernism, what's it all about? You have your truth, I have my truth. Well, that way of living can survive for a time in an affluent society where we have lots of time to play with ideas, play with personas for our lives. But in the end, each human being will have to face a cross in some form or other. And then all theories are going to evaporate. And all that we will be left is is there someone with me, suffering with me, loving with me as I go through life? Is there hope? This terrible affliction of despair, which I think drives a great deal of the younger generation towards false consolations, their addictions to moral relativism, the various manifestations and spin-offs of that, uh, public culture that would have been the envy of Dr. Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany. Uh, where did the young born into this world, not privileged like myself, born into just after the war, Second World War, where there was still a general Christian ethos in the world. We had some tools of discernment. And as the world began to mutate under a manipulated social revolution, we didn't always understand what was happening around us or even within ourselves. We made mistakes. We were fooled. And only divine mercy entering in, entering into our blindness and deafness, permits us to look up, to look away from the tyranny of the self, to look upwards from the tyranny of our environment, our social, psychological cosmos, if you will, to look beyond into the eternal, which is the timeless, which is the truly human the truly human. It's the fullness of our meaning, the fullness of our meaning as children of the Father. The whole truth about man, as John Paul II said over and over again, the whole truth about man. So, much of Christian culture has either been trivialized, commercialized, factoryized, the most interesting phenomenon I've found while traveling all over the world over the last 20, 30 years, every nation I go to, I find that these beautiful, beautiful sprigs, shoots of new life are coming up among the young. Um, 
it's evident in the renewal of faith, of course, but it's also very, very touching and remarkable to see the creative gifts that are emerging in the young generation. It just keeps springing up. It just keeps coming. And where does it come from? It doesn't have much of a place in the modern age, but it just keeps getting poured out and it just keeps rising up. This is the Holy Spirit at work through natural law, but also through grace. Man is created in the image and likeness of God, and our Father is a creator. True creation, when it is truth and love integrated as a single unified whole, not compartmentalized, single unified whole, is at heart creative. It gives life. It gives life to others, to those who look upon it. Um, often in my travels, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, I've met artists, painters mostly, musicians often, but many painters too, uh, raised in a totally uh, indoctrinated society and education system. Often they would say, well, I, w I was never a believer. You know, I, I thought it was a superstition, an outmoded myth. And that the social revolution, you know, the evolution of man, progress, or had, we left all that behind. But there was a void within me. There was an emptiness within me that nothing, nothing could fill. No amount of pleasure, no amount of pride stroking things. Nothing would fill it. Half my friends are dead by suicide in their early 20s. Uh, this, these are citizens of former Soviet nations. Uh, okay, I'm losing my train of thought here. I think, I think we suffer from the same beast here in the West, but it masquerades itself as our best friend endlessly pleases us, pleasures us. It seeks to replace the authority of God who tells us who we are, where we have come from, and where we are going. It seeks to replace his authority with a social deity, some kind of nebulous democratic deity that in, in, in truth is a, is a form of tyranny. The state and your media and your peer pressure in whatever form it comes will tell you who you are. This is who you are. And isn't it so interesting, a nation such as ours and many nations in the West, the nicest people in the world, our countrymen, one of the best places in the world to live. How many? children do we kill in the womb every year? How many elderly or sick or mentally ill people do we kill every year in this country? Why are we so surprised at the soaring amounts of suicides among the young? They have, they have taken it in with their mother's work, mother's milk. Bad metaphor for this topic. They have taken it in with their, with the oxygen they breathe, that no one has inherent value. If some of us have no eternal and inalienable rights to life, then none of us have that right. And some committee, some state, some parliamentary democratic decision to cut some of us out of the herd and declare us non-human, or a danger to the state, or a danger to the people. All of that is possible now. All of that may come. Dear God, I hope it doesn't go that far. 
but understand that we are immersed in a milieu that tells us we have no value. We have no eternal value, and our social value is only really according to what we produce. This is a monster, our form of a monster. It devours. Any of you know Goya's painting, Saturn devouring his children? Do you know that? Anyone know Goya's painting? Search for it on the internet. Yes, you do. Saturn devouring his children. Take a look at that. That's a portrait of our democracy in its late stage of degeneration. Because our form of democracy is not founded upon fundamental truths uh, external to our own opinions. It's a monster. How do we stand in the face of the monster? Well, if we live in grace, if we try to grow, try to overcome sin and error in our lives, and if we ask our Father for good bread, ask him for good bread, that we may know what our vocation is, that we may know what our missions within vocations are, he will give it. Now, it won't be insta-remedy. You know, we're so used, so used to instant gratification. Change the channel if you don't like it. Pop in the prayer coin, out comes your solution, and you're still in charge. You're still playing God. So God, in his infinite mercy, often allows us to wait and to suffer and to learn to ask our Father because it is so good for us to ask. My first art exhibit was just down the street here at a major gallery, major Canadian gallery in 1971, I think. It was almost a sellout show, and there were reviews in art journals, and there was uh, you know, lots of talk about how we're going to make we're going to make a successful Canadian artist out of you. And part of me, age 21, was going, Yeah, yeah, I love art. I, I want to be, I want to be that, and uh, I want to be able to live that way. And the first thing. Divine Providence very gently and subtly did was he removed me from that milieu. I thought I'll take my money from the art exhibit and I'll take a train trip across Canada. I always wanted to take a train trip across Canada, which I did. And to make an enormously long story a tad shorter, <laughs> I wound up uh, visiting friends in a tiny village in the Rocky Mountains where the next year I stayed. It was so beautiful, the mountains. I stayed, I met my wife, this incredibly awesome human being to whom I am married. We were married in 75. I was working, uh, had a job to support my wife, my new wife, and the baby we were expecting. And throughout that winter, as spring approached, I, I really had accepted it within myself that I would, I, I could not possibly be an artist in these times, let alone a Christian artist. Impossibility heaped upon impossibility. But she was the one who kept saying to me, Michael, you are an artist. God has given you a gift, and God does not give gifts to no purpose. God desires fruitfulness. She kept, in her gentle way, but tough love way, she just... So, to, to summarize, we thought about it, we prayed about it, and on May 1st, the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, she and I went to our local parish church, and we put my paintbrushes, my old paintbrushes, under the altar, and we, we had come to a peaceful and unified decision that I would devote a year of my life to being a painter for Christ, just to paint things of God as they came to me. And uh, we both felt, well, maybe me more than you, Sheila. Uh, no, definitely me more than you. It was sort of like, 
Wait a sec here. I've got to feed my family. I've got to keep a roof over us. This is not the Caribbean. I've got to heat this house. How am I going? And so forth. So there was, there was a wrestling match of faith, faith and hope, faith and hope, but also the undertow of fear, fear, fear. This is not the age of Michael O'Brien. This is the age of fear. Fear dominates so much that goes on within us. How do, I think I would have to say that the last what, almost 50 years since that decision to consecrate our life and our family to sacred art, a kind of a suicide mission for God, totally suicide. <laughs> really, that's what it felt like. But it, I think in our, our lowest moments, my lowest moments, I, was, I said, they won everything. Satan's spreading, Satan's growing. He's taking over more and more territory. And later I came across a beautiful phrase from John Paul II. He said, evil cannot grow. Evil does not grow. It spreads, it can spread as a parasite mutating on, uh, on us, making us into its agents. But evil has no life within us. It has no creativity within it. The creative kingdom is the kingdom of the Father Creator. It has a narrow gate. It feels really narrow in our times. But it leads into a vast, an incredibly vast, immeasurable kingdom that we can experience even now. We have tastes. We have moments of union. Uh, if we live the fullness of the sacramental life in prayer, uh, loving the scripture, learning to be silent, silence especially. Silent, asking God to speak to overcome the incessant noise within us, he will speak. So I had many, many things to learn in those early years. I'm still learning. I hope I'll never cease learning. But one of them was, it is really crucial to wait on God, to wait, waste time for God. So when I went to my, this little shack I had, which was my first studio, after our brave, heroic prayer in front of the church, yes, let's do great suicide mission for God. Went to my shack, took out my brushes, my old paints, the canvas, and absolutely no inspiration came. It was like, oh my goodness, I have entered the land of crazy people. <laughs> uh, 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 I've really made a horrible mistake here. I've quit my job and there are no jobs left in this town, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I thought, wait, my God speaking through my incredible wife, the grace, the moments, little bursts of life, light had said, stand firm. Move forward, go, begin, begin now. Take that first step, and it is just a first step, and it is really a baby step. Take that first step. And from that, everything grew. I, I went to this shack, the studio, every day for three weeks in a condition of radical empty, uh, uh, emptiness. Where is God? Where is God? Maybe I really am a crazy person. You know? Well, actually, I really am a crazy person. <laughs> but, uh, so, a, a, a state of emptying out. If you want to be really full, really full of the life of Christ, you have to experience a certain amount of emptying. Kenosis. All our fathers and mothers in the faith talk about it again and again. Kenosis, absolutely essential if you want to grow. If you want to grow, if you want to really become who you are, become who you are, as John Paul II said. 
become who you are, and we do not know who we are. Here's where authentic culture comes to our rescue. The grace will come. The grace will come if we do not lose heart, if we do, do not turn away into false c consolations or lesser goods. The kingdom of the self, even the kingdom of the self dipped in holy water can be very tricky. <laughs> be willing to be poor. I don't know if there are any young potential artists here, or I know there's one accomplished artist here, a couple. Uh, beauty comes forth from the human heart at a cost. A cost. Always there is a cost. Look at family life. New life comes forth at a cost. Always there's a cost, and sometimes it costs everything. Fruitfulness in your vocations, there's a cost. But fruitfulness will come. You may not see it in this world, but it comes. Um, so, uh, there's an ocean of things I want to say, but it's more words. There's an ocean inside of me trying to come through this little tiny brook or creek of my mouth. But above all, I want to say this. If you trust in the Lord, you will not be disappointed. Never will you be disappointed. Your idea of how the future should unfold mm, almost certainly will not come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> My son says the scriptures, if you aspire to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for an ordeal. Prepare yourself. I mean, ponder that. I'm, I'm not going to do an exegesis on that. It's just that, yeah, if you're going to resist the spiritus mundi and the spiritus diabolus that is spreading around us, prepare yourself for an ordeal. But keep in mind that within the cross, within the suffering, there will be many, many joys. There will be m many beauties, beauties you could not have expected. And at the same time, you will have the ultimate great gift of becoming who you are in Christ. Who you really are. Who you really are. Most of us don't know who we really are. Do not turn aside. Keep going. Stand firm. I love the Lord of the Rings so much. I just love it. I've read it over and over again, read it to my children many times. Now my wife and I are watching the movies and uh, The Hobbit. And, but I think it is the great myth of the modern age, just as the Odyssey and the Iliad were for the classical age, maybe Beowulf for the Middle Ages. It, it is, uh, Tolkien took pains to mention that the Lord of the Rings is not a Christian analogy. But it is, he said in one of his letters, it is a Christian myth. Uh, I should leave that to Dr. Schinken to go into <laughs> what the distinctions are here. But in my own paraphrase, I would say, the Lord of the Rings shows us the great war in the heavens come down to earth and reveals us to ourselves. We can stand outside of ourselves in our times and read about this epic mythic age and understand our own times as they really are, as they really are. And somehow breathing that fresh air of truth, terror, beauty, heroism, sacrifice, we are changed. Here is culture coming to our rescue again, true culture, authentic culture. Take a look at, um, I'm, I'm presuming here, forgive me, that all of you have either read the books or seen the movies. Uh, some of you may not have. But in essence, the smallest, the weakest, the most insignificant person in Tolkien's Middle Earth 
Is the very person chosen, this little guy, chosen to do the greatest work in overcoming evil? I'm not going to give it away for those who don't know the story, but please read the story before the book, before you watch the movies. Okay. He's a little guy, and his journey is fraught with, with oh, incredible difficulties. What am I saying here? At one point, Frodo, there's a great contentious debate among all the people of goodwill in Middle-earth. How are we going to resist the power of the evil that is coming upon us? And they're all, they're angry, they're fighting with each other, they're, they're turning against each other because they all have different strategies, they all are convinced that they know how to save the world. And in the end, they decide, they, 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 they all are, collapse into silence. And there's this magic ring which must be destroyed, a ring of total power. It must be destroyed, lest all the world fail and fall into darkness. And so the least likely steps forward. None of them want to take the ring to a distant mountain in the heart of evil territory, Mount Doom, to destroy it. It's the only place it can be destroyed. Frodo, the central character, he steps forward and something within him. He's not a person of great courage. He's not a traveler. He loves to stay home and cook. He says, I will take the ring. I will take the ring. Here in these few little words is the core. Here is the core. I will listen to the Lord. I'm not very good at listening, but I will listen to the Lord. I will obey the Lord. I will seek him. I will ask him to come to me in my poverty, my weakness, my sins, my faults, my wounds, all the mess. Here I am, Lord. Be, be that little guy. And in some sense, you have overturned the world. You have resisted the tyranny of Satan. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, says St. Paul. Doesn't mean you're going to be exempt from suffering. Oh no, you'll suffer more. But the saints, all the saints, every single one of them in all their vast variety of personality and temperament and life situations, all of them have said, I will take the cross. I will take the cross, but oh Lord, I don't have the strength for it. I don't have within me what it takes. And that's where the Lord can begin to work with us. So in summation, I would say, if you are called to do the impossible, such as to live as a consecrated person, to have a large family, to be a single person alone in the world with Christ, to have a great labor, to have a hidden labor. Uh, in the end, it doesn't matter. But you do it with love, and you do it with patient endurance at times, maybe long times, patient endurance, and Cry out to the Lord, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, every day, that you will dwell in him and he will dwell in you. That will shift the balance of the world. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for those uh, very inspiring and prophetic words.
I do feel that you are a prophet in our times. And sometimes all I have to do is look at you going into St. Hedwig's and I'm reminded, oh yeah, that's why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> He's just The look on his face reminds me of the, the vision um, that, that he and his wife Sheila had uh, 23 years ago and that we're trying to follow and ultimately for the sake of following our Lord. So thank you for your words today and um, Michael, are you willing to, you want to say something else? Yeah. Question, yes, okay, sure. Christine, yeah. you're our honored president and I really thank you. Oh. Truly, I thank you. So much. Yeah, you're, this is a great lady, doctor of literature. Uh -huh. she, 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 she and her husband Michael, she and her husband Michael are great servants of the Lord. And Michael's also a professor at the college. Um, uh, I think what? Michael's willing to, to answer yeah. questions if you have any. Yeah, I, I make a tiny correction. Uh, I wasn't one of the founders of the college. It was my wife, Sheila, who's going to kill me for saying this when I drive home with her. <laughs> she, she was one of the founders with a few, two or three other mothers uh, who said, we can't afford to send our children to TAC or Christendom. Or, and I can't remember whether it was you, Sheila, or someone else. It was you who said, well, let's, let's found our own. <laughs> well, this was, what, I think 1998 or 99, maybe. So the Lord has done the impossible again through Sheila and, her, and uh, Helen Fritz and other women and, and the early volunteer professors. It just grew and grew and grew, but always always on, on the foundation of sacrifice. So now here we are, a full-fledged degree-granting college 23 years later, and I think we say, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't being funded by uh, billionaires. It, wasn't, it was moms and dads, nickels and dimes, baby bonuses. You know, etc. For years, and then now we have a fundraising program that is that is well underway, uh, but always, always we're in greater need because we we can't house, give beds to all the students who want to come to us. We don't have the infrastructure yet. It's, we can't grow fast enough. So anyway, I digress. But let me just say, the Lord provides the increase. If we give him the little bits of bread that we have, we give him what we have, he'll do the rest. But we have to pray, so we are praying. Lest I launch on another talk, uh, do, you have any, do you have any questions? That's a good question. No, great question. Michael O'Brien, Father Elijah, 30 years ago, had apocalyptic themes. I mean, 30 years later, does the apocalypse preoccupy you? How, how do you think about it now? Well, I, I think when I was raising my family, I was very preoccupied by reflecting on the signs of the times, that there was a, an unprecedented character to the times we live in, particularly its, its capacity for a global culture that would be, uh, that would impose ideas and values, Nietzschean term, values, uh, that were in direct opposition to the will of God. So I was concerned about that, trying to raise our family in the midst of a milieu that was becoming increasingly anti-family, okay, that was violating the moral order of the universe uh, at every turn and getting worse and the infringement on family rights, parental rights. So all of that was part of the chemistry, but I, I would say also there was an inherent sense that um, I think we are living in 
apocalyptic times, the apocalypse. But that must always come for a Christian with certain qualifications. From the moment of the Lord's ascension into heaven, we have been living in the last days. St. John says, little children, it is the last days. Little children, in another translation, it is the final hour. So the task of all Christians in every generation, every generation, has been to regard the signs of the times, hopefully without fear, but with a certain, with a certain sober awareness of what is the world emerging around me? Uh, am I, but more important perhaps, am I, if these are the times the Lord foretold and the prophets foretold and the apostles foretold, am I spiritually prepared? You know, I don't mean prepared by knowledge. I don't mean survival kits. I mean, I mean, is my heart, is my heart disposed to rejoice? Is my, at the coming of the Lord, is my heart disposed to suffer for being a Christian? These are the questions each generation must ask. Now our Lord warned, especially in the 24th chapter of Matthew, but it's also in St. Luke, a similar uh, scene, where he's looking vastly forward to the end, even as he looks at the coming destruction of Jerusalem. So it's a multidimensional vision. At the end of the end, basically he's warning us that that generation which is least awake, that generation which is least awake will be the one which will be most vulnerable, vulnerable um, to the coming of the uh, definitive Antichrist, which will presage the return of Christ. The final persecution, it's all there in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, six, 671 to 74, I think. Anyway, it's a long answer. Um, I felt in prayer, write a story about what, what the dilemma would be for a Christian as, if the times grow darker and more seductive and more delusional. How do, we, how do we find our way through here? That was Father Elijah. But um, I also felt it's not simply enough to add to the vast body of apocalyptic scenarios that are out there in fictional and non-fictional form. That's, that's not helping anyone. Uh, so in all my books I've tried to, all my novels, I've tried to essentially raise the questions. Okay, the fundamental questions which must be asked by every generation. Are we awake? Are we pondering what's happening around us with good eyes, right eyes, the eyes of Christ? I ask those questions. I'm often mistaken for Dan Brown, you know, the, <laughs> the names, you know. So say, oh, I love your books about Left Behind. I say, well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, that's another author. And then people sometimes say, oh, I love your music. There's a very famous Marian singer named Michael O'Brien. <laughs> he's, he's very, very good. And, uh, anyway, so uh, what's, what's my point here? Okay, uh, the other books, I mean, these are also stories that well up within me with the same kind of strength and inspiration. And um, I, I feel to be a Christian is not simply to be an apocalypticist and nothing else. No. The life of Christ is in the ordinary. So we have, we have, Christian novelists a task to tell the stories, just as Tolkien did, tell the stories that show us our own greatness and our own follies, who, who show us who we are and all our weakness and all our beauty and all our greatness. So those are novels I've tried to write as well. Um, I returned, uh, actually only four, I think, of my novels, maybe five, are apocalyptic out of 15 novels. So 
The most recent was four or five years ago, Elijah in Jerusalem. So I have not returned to the theme because I think there's a, there's a good chance we may be living the real thing at the moment. So, so what is needed here? What is needed here? All of us need to hold hope on high, to ask for the supernatural gift of hope. I think, I think it is a very great danger to look for neo-gnostic solutions to getting ourselves through these times. The cross will come to all of us in some form or other. So I guess I feel my task has been to write stories about how people deal with suffering, how they deal with the cross, and not lose heart. You know, so I'm sorry, a long, long answer. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> I'd like to introduce my friend Kevin O'Brien here. <laughs> he's a great humorist. And he's, I will, I'll say no more. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, I had, to, I had to learn very early on if I was going to write or paint, I had, I had to develop discipline. In the early years, it was just painting. The inspiration came, things began to flow. But I also knew my nature could be easily distracted. So I had to develop a discipline of going to the studio every day. And even though I had just sat there, even though I just tried to pray in my emptiness or read scripture, no inspirations coming. I went. I was there. So gradually that habit of discipline uh, took hold in those early years, and I think it's continued all the way, and Sheila has been tremendously respectful of it, although she draws the line at me working six days a week, uh, which I do if I can get away with it, but mostly, <laughs> and I have to come to meals. <laughs> and then we have, we have family time and together time in the evenings. <coughs> but I would say one of the greatest uh, distractors from my creative life has been the internet. Uh, I had a website for a while. A friend convinced me that this would disseminate my work worldwide, and indeed it did. It was, people began to know my work all over. And, uh, but the influx of correspondence, you now me raised in an older time of history where if you receive a letter, you respond to it. If, if someone speaks to you face to face, you engage them, they're a person. You, and I still am trying to get my head around this tsunami of verbiage that deluges us, probably all of us or most of us. And it was a long, long learning to say, wait a sec here. I, I cannot answer 800 people. I, cannot offer my insights into things they're struggling with as much as I sympathize. I will pray for them, but thank you, Catherine. So I had to be tough with myself and say, uh, take a look at the reality here. Half of your day is spent answering emails, all very valid emails, some of them really urgent. So uh, half of my day, that means half of my creative life has ceased. Okay. Somewhere in my head was the fact that, was, was the modus operandi in the modern age that you have to promote. And I thought, no, for the last 40, 50 years, we've been going 
in the direction opposite to where the modern age is going. Yes, they're good tools. Yes, they can do much good, all that technology. But frankly, I'm just sick to death of it. And what's the cost of it? What are the costs? What are the hidden costs? What are the psychological costs? So I said uh, to myself, no, I'm not engaging it anymore. I'm really, really sorry if people feel hurt or rejected. Uh, <coughs> I just can't do it. So at some point you have to have the humility to say to yourself, the only thing I can give to the world is who I really am. That's true for each of us, who we really are. And that means I'm a person who tells stories and makes paintings and is the father of a family, primarily, you know. And if I can't even get to my children's emails because I'm desperately trying to answer urgent, desperate emails from around the world, uh, you see, you see how our heads can get spinning. We have to return to the basic perspectives of reality, the proper proportion of things, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, the proper proportion. My family is first. My mission within the vocation of family is second. If, if divine providence arranges a moment of encounter with another human being, I will respect that and see what maybe I have something to say or give. So. I mean, it was a, a long struggle for me to finally get it. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you take a sip of water, too. Yeah, take that chance. Thank you. Um, speaking of technology, I'll try to put my mouth to the... <laughs> a few more minutes. Yes. Michael, you just mentioned their um, divine providence. Can you just share with us your experience of the divine providence? Well, it's multidimensional for one thing, and it's very gentle and quiet often. On occasion, divine providence is dramatic. For Sheila and I, in our early years, when I was trying to survive as an icon painter of all, of all impossible tasks and raise a family, uh, Every now and then, someone would buy an icon or some of my early Christian painting that was non-Byzantine. Uh, but sometimes six, eight months would go by. Now, we had people who were very generous to us. We had benefactors, $50, $100, or uh, a desperate box of groceries. That went on for many years, and it was particularly hard on me as the father, the father provider. It was really hard, but sometimes when we were just like totally, absolutely desperate, couldn't pay the rent that month. There's nothing, hardly anything in the cupboards to eat. Two little boys, two little children. Uh, we're back in crazy land again. We're back in temptation land again. But in the moment of temptation, it's always a golden opportunity. Uh, Sheila and I knelt down on the floor. This happened many times. We would kneel down on the floor and we would say, God, our Father, we really need your help. We really need to sell a painting. As you can see, we can't, we can't pay the rent. We, can't, we don't have any money to buy food. Uh, I think half a dozen times over the years, within an hour, the phone would ring and someone would say, are you the Christian artist? Um, <laughs> I, I would say, yeah. Uh, I would say, yes, I'm a Christian artist. Well, I'm, I'm looking for some, some Christian art and I'd like to buy a painting. Is there anywhere I could see your art? I'd say, no, but you could come over to my home. If, uh, so. Like within an hour of that prayer, 
uh, an hour or two, the painting would be sold and we would be good for a month or two. Uh, in terms of housing, we lived in a few rectories over the years. We lived in a couple of shacks. Uh, I mean, like, real shacks. <laughs> and uh, uh, only in later life were we able to uh, buy a home. Actually, the bank owned the home, but you know what I mean, a home of our own. And that was after, long after the books started to be published. But often, the landlord would say, well, uh, I'm moving in, or I've just sold the house. Uh, you'll have to find another place to live. So we would go down on our knees, and you have two weeks, or you have a month. We would go down on our knees, and often within an hour, maybe a day or two, an incredible new place would open up. Uh, you know, so all the time, uh, I'm dealing with my husband-father issues inside, anxious, um, anxious, anxious, anxious. And I think now, from hindsight, if only I can say this, if only I had trusted more, if only I had trusted more. But it was, it was a long discipleship in learning to trust that God is always at work. We want, we want solutions. We want cessation of pain. We want quick fixes. And I think our Lord is saying to us, through all of those trials, he's saying, I am with you. I am with you. And I'm taking you farther and deeper. I'm with you. Trust me. And so, you know, we've never been without food or a roof over our heads. Never. Do we have a retirement plan? No. <laughs> Do we have security? No. <laughs> Who cares? I, I don't care. I mean, the only real security in this world is to know, to know who you are in the Lord and to be happy there. So I'm not saying don't do reasonable things to look after your family. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But the core thing is our security is in the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Okay. Not always an easy distinction to make. Yes. But to pray, to pray, and to never cease praying and asking. It is good for us to ask. Ask. He will give. He will give. So thank you very much. Oh, there's a question. One more. Oh, I would have to say the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings, for sure. I also love portions of the Silmarillion, especially the early Genesis section. That's very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, I just love it all. All three volumes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but especially, and, and uh, it always chokes me up when I hear Frodo say in his little voice, I will take the ring. Just always chokes me up. I will take the ring. But the second thing that always chokes me up is and at the ultimate end of all this quest, Sam rides his pony home back to his family. And he says, well, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> or is it, well, I'm home, I forget. But it, it just chokes me up. I'm back. I'm home, is what he's saying. I am home. And all the ordeal, unbelievable ordeals and torments that he went through to support Frodo's quest. Sam is as, as great a hero as Frodo. Uh, brings him back to this moment where all the good things of life have been preserved in the Shire and that life, life can begin again. And the two great heroes and all their company of heroes remain 
relatively unknown in the Shire. So anyway, with that, I would thank you all for coming. And uh, if anyone has books who would like me to sign them, I'd be very happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Michael. If you wouldn't uh, mind um, staying seated a little bit longer, I would like to say a few more words. Uh, first, to, to sort of um, acknowledge Michael beyond our uh, applause uh, and the, the small token of our appreciation, I just want to mention that the college is in the process of having a special plaque made that will accompany the St. Joseph the Provider painting at Seat of Wisdom, acknowledging Michael O'Brien as our artist and writer in residence, and Michael O'Brien's contributions to art and Catholic culture in Canada and beyond. So just um, directly uh, ahead of me is um, the painting, St. Joseph the Provider, and um, so that's the, the painting we'll have a, a plaque made for. And also I just want to um, acknowledge that Michael O'Brien has, uh, has already received Our Lady Seed Wisdom College's Catholic Culture Award in 2014. So finally I just want to um, take advantage of your listening ears to, to tell you a little bit about Our Lady Seed Wisdom College. I feel like I really have a responsibility to share that. The people here, if you love Michael O'Brien, You'll love the college. <laughs> How's that for an advertisement? <laughs> I, w I, I will try not to take too much time, but I want to get to the heart of it. We offer an education that forms the whole person. So it's not just intellectual content in, intellectual content out, right? We actually have a, an alumna here of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. Don't tell me, Sister Elizabeth Marie of the Holy Family? Okay, all right. I have to get used to her new name. Uh, it's exciting. But um, yes, uh, we, we don't just put education, put information in people's heads. We have a whole educational program that involves the, um, residents' life, right? They live in small houses. It's not big dorms, small houses. So they're really like families. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing alumni all over the room. It's kind of like, yeah, see her, see her, <laughs> see him. Um, but um, they, so they learn to live in Catholic culture. So tying in with my, what Michael's been talking about, with, with all the negative forces and culture around us today, what can we do? I mean, we're raising kids. Our, our oldest just turned 13. I have a teenager. Wow. Um, so I'm sure you know, many people are thinking the same thing. What can we do to help form our young people? It's not enough just to, to read the catechism to them, right? They need a community. They need Catholic culture. And that's what we have at Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. Right? We have... Um, about 100 students at the moment, and so they live in these small dorms of 8 to 12 people, generally, a couple are bigger, um, and, and they learn to live in a Catholic community, right? They pray together, they eat together, uh, they study together, and um, they, they, so they learn what it means to be Catholic in a way that people, many people don't have the opportunity to learn these days. Uh, and then, of course, the intellectual content, uh, well, I say it's not just that, it is, it is very seriously um, good. <laughs> it's excellent. They get an excellent formation in the Catholic liberal arts. So history with Dr. Shaw. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful professor, very paternal. He cares about his students. He guides them. He's not just giving them content, he's mentoring them. And really, that's, that's a very big effort when you have an incoming class of you know, 45 students. But he does it. I see him do it. It's amazing. Um, and so we have, you know, history, literature, philosophy, theology, classics, these are our main disciplines, but then we also have, you know, it's the whole liberal arts program, we've got some mathematics, natural uh, science, uh, fine arts, music, uh, our music uh, instructor is here, Catherine Helferty at the back, who's been serving you wine, multitasking, <laughs> a woman of many talents. Um, but I could go on and on, but uh, let me just, you know, make a few more key points. We do have, we do take our spiritual life very seriously as well. So we always have a chaplain, um, and actually we're very blessed to have our associate chaplain of, of 11 years, I think, 10 or 11 years, Father Joseph Hattie, OMI. The man is a legend. 
he really is a legend, and I just about my jaw just about dropped to the floor when I when I saw him come in the room, and I thought, Father, how is here? <laughs> it's hard to explain. If you don't know the man, get to know him, and you'll see why I'm so excited. Um, but but we take the spiritual life very seriously. So we have um, you know, always um, a chaplain and and uh, sometimes an associate chaplain as well. Uh, available for confession, spiritual direction. St. Hedwig's Church is really just literally a stone's throw away, and so we have daily mass there, confessions all the time, uh, rosaries, divine, chaplet of divine mercy at three every weekday. Uh, they often do prayers in their houses as well. I mean, it's just so, you know, compared to some colleges that call themselves Catholic, we really are Catholic. It's really a Catholic university. We offer a Bachelor of Catholic Studies. And um, so just, again, get to know us if you don't already know us. It's a really great thing, and I just need to spread the word because we're still so hidden, and maybe that's how God wants us, but, but I think he's inviting more people to share the responsibility of this college, <laughs> right? So put your name on that little slip. Get, have a chance to win a Michael O'Brien novel, and uh, give us your email so we can send you information. And then you can, okay, number one, pray for us. That really does move mountains. I have seen it, as Michael O'Brien was saying. You know, you pray, you see God's response. It's amazing, but we invite you to pray for us. Send us students, right? If you have children of college age or coming up to that, consider sending them to us. You will not regret it. It's just an amazing experience. And then if you are gifted and have the means, you know, give us money too. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I want to just give you um, a quote. I was talking to one, I'll, I'll end with this. I was talking to one of our students. He's a first year guy who's very keen. He's one of these encyclopedic minds, right? He's going to go far. He's going to be a leader of the future. I hope he will be. But I said, can I, can I, can you write that down, what you just told me? And can I quote you? I won't give your name. He says, okay, sure. So he sent me an email at like midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was procrastinating. <laughs> but anyway, this is a quotation from a, a current student. He says, our Lady Seat of Wisdom College has by far the best faculty I have ever seen. He's been to some other universities, didn't like it, came to us. By far the best faculty I've ever seen, with a core of professors unmatched by those I've studied under from other institutions. For their knowledge of their respective fields, their effectiveness in teaching classes, and the structure of their courses. The college excels in giving students every chance to form themselves in their whole person, particularly spiritually, intellectually, and in the accepting of responsibility. The sacrifices of all the faculty through time set, spent supporting students and financially to help keep tuition affordable deserve nothing but the highest praise. May God bless them and Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College for the service they provide." Unquote. So I couldn't have said it better. Uh, the student really, uh, really put it uh, put it best, I think. So, do do find out more about us um, if you are if you are open to doing so.